Hello chums and welcome to another episode of Project Supercar and in this episode we're going to talk about the driving position and why so many supercars get it wrong. Now let me start by saying if you're going to be designing your own supercar there is certain restrictions that will play a part in the driving position. You can't really avoid this. Things like how low the car is, the wheels and how close it is to the pedals, these sort of things where the engine is located. There's so much going on within this supercar that will dictate how the position will end up being that quite frankly you can't really avoid. Now we all know that pretty much every supercar ever made and built always starts with a design. Um, one car that springs to mind, which is a particular favourite of mine, would be the Lamborghini Countach. Now we all know that was built on the design first and then the engineers had to make everything fit. So one of the compromises of the Lamborghini Countach is the driving position. Um, obviously it's so low and the wheels are so far forward that the driving position is almost like you're lying down. There was other problems with the Countach as well with the gearbox being in the center of the car this pushed the seat over to the outside of the car which made you sort of have a, a diagonal sort of position on the wheel. Now although I've never owned a Lamborghini Countach a friend of mine took me out for a spin in his replica which was great fun and I have sat in a real one and it, it, it is brilliant, I mean, it's exciting and all the rest of it, but yes, the driving position is flawed. You'll find that the steering wheel is sort of at an angle, it's a bit offset, the pedals are over to the centre of the car. I'm sure you could get used to it, and it's part of the experience, so I'm not, I'm not sort of, um, I don't know, I'm not sort of degrading the Countess at all, I'm glad it was made, but yes, there are some flaws in it. When you open the scissor doors, I thought they were going to have a lot of play and sort of wiggle around a lot. They're solid. I thought I was going to get in this car and everything would feel really flimsy, especially the instrument panel here. Look at this gauge cluster. It's just a rectangle bolted onto the dash. It has such an 80s old school feel about it that isn't actually all that nice or really very ergonomic and nobody cares. It's part of the charm and strangely, the interior feels really solid. It feels so far better built than I expected. Air conditioning doesn't work. The speedometer doesn't work. I mean, there are those quirks, of course. However, this is a 30-year-old car with 70,000 miles. This is not a garage queen. It's actually holding up pretty well, all things considered. These seats are just a crescent moon of padding. They have none of the normal lumbar or advanced construction of modern race seats and yet it does feel like you could sit in these seats comfortable for a long time it's just you're gonna have to be short i have no choice but to sit here just kind of a little bit hunched and yes in that classic italian style your feet are way to the right you're you're, you're tucked around the front wheel you can almost feel the treads going by with your left ankle Now when I was building my Countach replica and developing the Evo Countach kit, um, see my channel, there's some videos on it, I did manage to tweak the driving position so it is a lot more ergonomic. Um, I had the luxury of not having the Lamborghini gearbox taking up so much room so I could cheat a little bit and just bring the seats in a little bit. I also managed to move the uh, pedals a bit more outward and I actually got the steering wheel completely flat and in line with the seat. Now another great car that has a compromised driving position would be the Lancia Stratos. Now again this car was built at an engineering point first, in other words the um, wheelbase was set up, the engine and position of the car was set up suspension and then the last thing to be designed was the driving position. Now this led to a very awkward and strange position similar to the Countach but a little bit more extreme. Steering wheel up here, not lining up, you're almost sitting with, the, with your legs pointing into the centre of the car. 
Hello, it's me from the future again. Now I did try uploading this video on Friday, but I got an email from YouTube. Copyright claim? But I'm covered under fair use, aren't I? Now I did want to show you a clip from Top Gear of them driving the Stratos and talking about the driving position. But that's been stopped due to copyright. But this is covered under fair use. Whenever I use a clip, I always leave a credit in the corner somewhere around here. I also credit at the end of my episode and then I leave a link in the description below. So if you want to see the full length version of the video, you can. And I never make um, a claim that it's my work or anything. I mean, what makes it worse is I live in a socialist hellhole called the UK, where we are forced to pay for state television, which is called the BBC. So I actually paid for that episode of Top Gear to be made, but if I use a clip from it, somehow I'm violating copyright. How does that work? People in the UK are getting sick of the BBC, and 5 million people no longer pay the TV licence. What are the odds that that's going to become 5 million and 1? Well, unfortunately, it looks like I won't be able to use any clips from Top Gear in the future, which is a shame. I met Jamie Clarkson once, and he seems like a, a nice fellow. I don't think he would care or mind if some Billy Bob with a tiny little YouTube channel like mine would use clips from Top Gear. So if you're watching Jeremy, sorry buddy, but I can't use your work anymore. That's a bit of a shame. So anyway, instead of Top Gear, here's a clip from The Smoking Tire. Please check out their channel and watch the video in full if you want. If you do check out their channel and watch the video in full, please click like and tell them that Project Supercar sent you. So enough of this rant, on with the show. The Launch Stratos is one of the very few truly purpose-built rally cars. Designed and built for rallying, it's not really good at anything else. <laughs> it's, it's, How many of these do they make? Uh, about 500. And you said this is one of 25, does that mean 25 works rally cars? Uh, group 4, yeah, okay. Group 4. So this was built as a race car from new, from yes. Launch. This was not, not a converted road car or anything nope. like that. Awesome. And uh, it's got the Dino motor in the back, right? Dino 246. Yeah, the uh, Ferrari V6. 2.4 liter. Sounds delightful. Yep. Um, and a five-speed gearbox, uh, dog leg first. So uh, let's let's drive. How do we do this? What do we do? Oh, this is a good day. Oh, whoa. Okay. All right. That was uh. This this is geared a little low. You Sorry. mentioned that. So you mentioned that this car is geared, what to me seems absurdly low. You said yes. this car will max out around 60 miles an hour. 55 is about it. 55, and that's yeah. top gear, red line. But we're, we're getting there pretty quick. <laughs> uh. <laughs> my feet are about eight inches over to the right. My steering wheel is up against my right leg. Once again, wow, very darty. Is this, is this one of, if not the shortest wheelbases of any car ever made? It, it has to be. Another car with a compromised driving position is another Lamborghini, surprise, surprise. And it seems to be an Italian sort of flavor going on here anyway, but um, I'm not bashing the Italian cars, I love them. So, you know, don't get upset, internet. And uh, anyway, getting back to the Lamborghini Muria. Um, yes, that is another tight driving position. So yeah, take a look at this video. Now, we have a look at the dash and how it all works. You've got these two big clocks. Um, a 300 kilometer an hour um, speedo and no red line and a 10,000 RPM tacker. We won't be using all those. Other gauges here, I can see it's charging the temp to temperature, oil pressure's there, temperature of the oil is good as well. I'm really pleased to see the oil cooler. So anyway, I'm going to get myself out to the village and get on some, some better roads. Like the Lotus, it's quite tight in the cabin again. I find I, I'm, let's say, six foot one, six foot two, I can't cope with the sun visor, so I just have to fold that forward so I don't keep head butting it. Everything's very close. The bulkhead is fixed, obviously, because of the, um, the engine. It's the, the seat runners don't go all the way back as much as you'd like. The wheel 
it's quite a nice position actually, it's not crazy out there and your knees are sort of up by the wheel. So taking all that on board, I absolutely wanted a good driving position in my car. That was one of the things I wanted to get right. I wanted to get the pedals almost in line with the driving position. I wanted the steering wheel to be absolutely central. I didn't want the steering wheel to be twisted in any way. And I wanted a very comfortable, almost modern driving position in my car. Now this is a bit difficult because I have very limited funds. So um, there were restrictions and I am sort of limited to the parts that I am using. But I think I managed it. Now some of you might notice that I'm using an OEM dashboard. This is from the original donor car and there's a load of reasons why I did. Uh, we'll go into that in another episode. Um, but this helped me set up the driving position. So what I did is I cut the original bulkhead out of the donor car and I used that so I could line up roughly where the pedals went, the steering column went, um, brake booster, um, a whole host of other things so then I could line up the seat with the dash and the bulkhead to get my ideal driving position. So this driving position is pretty much similar to a typical Audi and they're, they're great anyway so I'm, I'm starting with a good base. Now the way to make it fit into such a low slung supercar like this is I have to steal a few inches away from the uh, height of the floor so I lifted the floor up and I obviously lifted the or should I say dropped the roof down. Now this does mean that I can't use um, original Audi seats and it also means that the driving position is slightly inclined back. But this is a mild compromise and I think it works really well. So anyway, I think it's time I probably pulled the seats out, brought the camera in and showed you um, how I set it all up. So what I'll do is I'll just unbolt and take these seats out so we can have a quick look at them and then I'll show you the chassis and I'll show you how these seats bolt in. Oh yeah, I'm just going to remove these. These are mock up. The idea is, is um, this part here is actually from the old door, from the, from the donor, and because I want to use as much as I can from the original donor to keep the cost down, I want to use the stereo from it. Now the idea on this car is to have the speakers inside the footwell, just inside here, and not in the door. Because if I put the speakers in the door, it will upset the gas strut. But I'm getting ahead of myself, and we'll do that in another episode. The seats are out, it's looking a bit dirty in there. It's quite a lot of saw, sawdust and uh, whatnot, which is to be expected with all the sanding I was doing on the bodywork. But um, yeah, it's a bit grimy and uh, a bit grotty in here and it's been sitting in my garage for a few years so uh, I think it's time uh, to give it a clean. Shh, I don't actually have a shop vac yet. Just between me and you, okay? There we go, that looks a bit cleaner inside. Got rid of some of the sawdust and the spider webs and all that sort of stuff. It's looking a bit cleaner. Gonna, we can have a quick sneak peek look at the handbrake. That'll do. And steering wheel. Maybe a quick sneak peek at the pedals. But we'll cover all that in another episode. Because the Audi standard seats were no good for this application and weren't going to fit in my car, I had to get some sports seats. Now I did have loads of money and I couldn't really rush out and buy £3,000 worth of Recaros, so I got the next best thing. So I've got some budget seats, they're not branded, they're from China, off eBay, but they were fine for mock-up purposes. Although they were cheap, I didn't really want to mess them up with welding and all that sort of thing, so I did cover them in plastic. 
But I think I'll peel the plastic off so you can have a look. Well, the plastic sort of worked, but after a few years of uh, building this thing, it does look like some welding sparks got through. Never mind, they'll do for mock up. Because the base of this seat is a lot more shallow than the original Audi seats, this can now sit lower in the car. Oof. Let me guess, you're gonna wanna see the original Audi seat so I can compare it to this seat and show you the difference, right? Okay. The only Audi seat I've got is in this donor car. Now, because of the bad weather and the seat's brakes, um, I'm a little bit out of sync with my episodes. Um, I wanted to get a lot further ahead with the strip down of this donor car than I am. And really, I wanted the interior out of this car so I could compare it with my seats on this episode. But there's a bit, been a bit of a delay. Anyway, so what I'll do is I'll just push this out, I'll just pull one seat out, and then we can compare seats. Before I pull the seat out of this thing, I just want you to have a look at the standard driving position of this Audi. Legs are like this, plenty of headroom. So what I did in my car is I lifted the floor up, which in effect brings your legs up so they're almost flat, and then I tilted the seat back a little bit so I could lower the ceiling. The rest of the driving position is pretty much the same. Now I know what some of you are going to say, that if I lift the floor up, I'm going to lose some foot space. Well, I actually gained some foot space in my car. Let's measure the size in this one. So if we measure the amount of space for the seat, you'll find it comes in at about 140 centimeters. And that is all the way back to the rear seats. So let's check out the floor space in my car. And as you can see, it is about 160 centimeters. see the height difference in the base of the seat. This is much higher than this one. So I sit quite high up in this seat. This one, I'm a lot lower down. Now another problem I had is the seat runners. If you take a look at the Audi ones, these are designed, surprisingly enough, for an Audi A6. Now these seat runners are pretty much universal, meaning I can make the brackets in my car a lot easier for these seat runners than I can for the Audi ones. Another trick I used was to tilt the seat backwards, just to give me a few extra inches of headroom. And I did this by tilting the brackets in the chassis so the one at the rear was lower than the one at the front. Now these seats fit quite nicely in my car and they're quite comfortable you know considering they're bargain seats 
Um, but I'm not sure if these are British standard or they are type approved. Now this might cause a bit of a problem when I come to IVA testing my car. Now another thing I'd like to do is to put OEM seats in here, maybe from a different donor. The Audi ones aren't going to do it, maybe from a Mazda, uh, I don't know, or um, in fact if any of you out there know of a good OEM seat without any airbags that might fit this sort of setup, let me know and I'll uh, check it out. Now I knew all this YouTubing would make me rich. I've just made three dollars. Oh, hang on a minute, that ain't YouTube. No, that's not YouTube. That's DTube. I'm actually making... Well, there you go. Three dollars, woohoo! I'm rich! Well, okay, I'm not rich. But every penny does help. And like I've mentioned in other episodes, I want to get to the fun stuff. I want to get to the fiberglassing. I want to get to build, building the turbo chassis. I want to get some big turbos. And it is going to cost some money. Now, the YouTube algorithms are not kind to this channel, so I just need your help to spread the word and break the algorithms. So, if you could do that, that would be great. And until next time, oh wait a minute, I'm going to have to push that Audi back, aren't I? Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, I forgot I've got to push this thing back, haven't I? Okay, it's back in there now. By the way, if you do make a comment, I do make every effort to reply to you. Now, for some unknown reason, YouTube used to email me when someone made a comment, but that doesn't seem to be working too well at the moment. So if you make a comment and I haven't replied, then I'm not ignoring you, it's just I don't know. So uh, I apologize and it's out of my hands. But uh, anyway, I'm gonna continue battling through with YouTube Spread the word, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.